session. Good afternoon, everyone. I am grateful to the organizers for giving me this opportunity to speak today on repetitive nerve stimulation study. I'll keep it brief and try to finish it on time. So I'll start with the basic physiology of uh, nerve conduction across the initially the presynaptic terminal, then across the synaptic cleft and into the postsynaptic junction. Now, this is a very simple slide showing uh, as the action potential comes down the nerve terminal, it does something in the neuromuscular junction, which releases the acetylcholine from the presynaptic terminal. It attaches to the acetylcholine receptor on the junctional folds of the postsynaptic uh, membrane and uh, it gives rise to something called a muscle fiber action potential. But this, uh, if you go into the details, then there is something called quanta. So quanta uh, package of uh, acetylcholine uh, molecules packaged in vesicles, which lie in the presynaptic terminal as discrete units. And uh, when there is a stimulus, these get uh, uh, into the synaptic plate by exocytosis and gets attached to the postsynaptic membrane. There are three stores for this quanta. The primary store lies just uh, beneath the presynaptic membrane. There's a secondary store which gets mobilized and the tertiary store is a reserve store which lies in the cell body or axon. But actually this is not that simple. If you look, in, uh, look at this slide, we'll see that a lot of things are going on. So the action potential will uh, travel uh, along the nerve terminal. Then uh, it will do something to a voltage gated calcium channel, VGCC, PQ type. And there will be influx of calcium that will give rise to some mechanism by which the acetylcholine vesicles, they are, they undergo exocytosis and the rest of the process. But if you look at the postsynaptic membrane, then we find that acetylcholine receptor is not the only molecule. There is mask, there's LRP4 and uh, rapsin, and there are also other molecules being identified. Now, several of these molecules are now important for neuromuscular junction disorders. In fact, if you look carefully, there is acetylcholine histories. So after the action of acetylcholine is over, this helps to remove the acetylcholine from the synaptic cleft. But for today's discussion, we will simplify it into postsynaptic and presynaptic to understand the uh, basic things about repetitive nerve stimulation study. So the classical example of postsynaptic disorder is myasthenia gravis and presynaptic is lambert eaton myasthenic syndrome, which uh, is due to involvement of the PQ and n type VGCC. But this is important electrophysiologically, this classification, because we can differentiate. The basic physiology of conduction is when the acetylcholine gets uh, uh, attached to the postsynaptic uh, membrane, it generates end plate potential. Now, if this end plate potential is more than the threshold, then it generates what is called a muscle fiber action potential. And several muscle fiber action potentials together gives rise to CMAP. This is, the, uh, uh, this is actually what we record. We record the CMAP. There is something called safety factor. This safety factor, the concept of safety factor is very important for RNST because this is the target of the entire endeavor. Safety factor is the amplitude of EPP above the threshold needed to general, generate the MFAP. That means if uh, say uh, a voltage change of mass, about 50 is required to generate MFAP, the EPP will be around 80. So the 30 will be the safety factor. Now, this safety factor is what we target by uh, uh, repeated nerve stimulation study. The physiologic basis of RNS is this simple equation M equal to PN. M is the number of quanta released during a stimulation. P is the probability of release with the stimulation which is around 0.2, that is 20%, because altogether uh, all the quanta are not released uh, together. And then the number of quanta which is immediately available, so the primary store, which is around 1000. So when we uh, give uh, repetitive nerve stimulation, there are two types. One is slow and one is rapid. 
slow rns is what we do initially here we give a train of about 3 hertz stimuli and it leads to progressive decline of the quanta from primary stop so as the quanta decreases of course the epp amplitude will fall however in non normal person it still remains above the threshold for mfap so it generates the action potential and after few seconds there is secondary mobilization which repairs this deficit so if you look at this picture we will see the suppose uh, at, uh, with the first stimulus uh, about 200 quanta released of the 1000 that is 20% and it generates the mfap say the threshold for mfap is around 15 so if we see it is 40 is the epp and it generates the mfap and we get a normal cmap with the next train of stimuli gradually the epp decreases as less and less quanta are released however it is still above 15 so it continues to generate the mfap and we get a normal cmap if we look at the lower graph we'll see that uh, we the shaded area is the safety factor but this depends on the acetylcholine of course and the density of the acetylcholine receptors what happens in myasthenia gravis the density acetylcholine receptor falls so the initial epp itself is around 20 say 50% decreased but it is enough to give rise to an mfap with the second stimulus of the uh, rns it is still about 15 but gradually we find that it is falling below 15 so now it cannot generate the mfap this is the basis of rns study we want to catch this part where it is failing to generate the mfap and this translates into a decremental pattern of cmap so what is a decremental response is the amplitude which is the baseline cmap minus the amplitude of the lowest cmap divided by the baseline cmap amplitude into 100 so any decrement more than 10% is defined as abnormal an interesting thing happens gradually after the uh, fourth stimulus round about by the fifth or sixth stimulation the decrement begins to get repaired by mobilization of the secondary stop so we get a u shape so there is the initial cmap it decreases and then it again increases this u shape is characteristic and if we get this this is very suggestive of neuromuscular junction disorder and if we do a good rnst technically correct rnst we should get this in a myasthenia gravis patient but then comes the concept of a rapid rns what we do in rapid rns we increase the frequency of stimulation to 10 to 50 hertz now why do we do this because we know that the influx of calcium is essential for exocytosis of acetylcholine now it takes about 100 millisecond for calcium to diffuse back so if we give a 10 hertz stimulus then it doesn't let calcium escape so by the time the calcium diffuses out there is another stimulus so there is accumulation of calcium this accumulation of calcium and increased mobilization of quanta from the secondary store it repairs the depletion of quanta this in normal subject is same as slow rns so we might get some pseudo facilitation otherwise in post synaptic disorders that is as i already said in myasthenia gravis the decrement gets repaired but it is most important to diagnose a pre synaptic disorder such as lems whereby there is an incremental response sometimes the baseline cmap of lems is very low in that case after rapid rns we get a increment of the cmap now this is what is called an incremental response so high cmap minus the baseline cmap increment of more than 100% is important for pre synaptic neuromuscular junction disorders as i said in normal subjects there may be pseudo facilitation so it may increase but it is up to 40% and between 40 and 100% is considered equivocal so now we get incremental response for pre synaptic nmgs it is important to remember that even for pre synaptic neuromuscular junction disorders slow rns will lead to the same decremental response it is the rapid rns which differentiates between the two however we have to remember the rapid rns is a very painful uh, process and it is very difficult to perform in a kid so for in the pediatric population we often uh, 
substitute a rapid RNS by uh, this method. This is a brief maximal voluntary exercise for 10 seconds. I'll demonstrate this uh, because of the hybrid nature of the uh, workshop. Huh? We have um, prepared some videos, demonstrative videos, where we'll brief videos where we'll show the methods uh, in uh, both slow RNS and rapid RNS. So we give a 10 seconds maximal voluntary exercise and then we do the process. Now, there are two things in exercise testing. One is post exercise facilitation, which is by brief exercise of 10 seconds, which we are we use as a substitute of rapid RNS, or we also use to see the repair of the decrement in slow RNS. And there is post exercise exhaustion. This we utilize with the exercise of one minute where sometimes the decremental response is not uh, adequate in those cases this helps after this uh, exhaustion we get a definite decremental response so this is decrement at rest say 32 percent so post exercise facilitation that is a 10 seconds of brief uh, exercise it recovers repairs the decrement to eight percent but this is post exercise exhaustion so it was already 32 percent now, after one minute of prolonged exercise, it decreases further to 44% and 56%. Okay. Now, this was the uh, fundamentals of uh, uh, RNS, but there are some technical factors to remember. Number one is immobilization. If the limb moves too much or the electrodes move too much, then we won't get a good recording. This is uh, very tough to do in a child. Second is the stimulus must be supramaximal. Uh, by supramaximal, we mean it should go, we will get the CMAP first and then we'll go 20 to 25% above that current. Temperature should be controlled. And of course, if the patient is on any acetylcholine uh, esterase inhibitors, it should be withheld prior to the study. Selection of nerves. Usually we select one proximal nerve, one distal nerve and the facial. These are the uh, you, some of the useful nerve muscle combinations for facial views, orbicularis oculi nasalis, trapezius. These two we commonly use. Deltoid and biceps are less used, and ulnar nerve in the forearm. For the lower limbs, we can use peroneal. Okay. Now considerations in infants and young children. Number one uh, is a small limb size. So we, the, we need special small electrodes and the stimulus should be relatively low intensity. Second is limb temperature can fall rapidly in, a, in an infant. Of course, cooperation may be an issue. And it is often difficult to make the child understand how to exercise the muscle of interest. We often prefer the proximal stimulation if the, according to limb size. Another important feature is the immaturity of the neuromuscular junction. In normal premature as well as full-time infants, the safety margin of transmission, which we discussed, is already low due to end plate immaturity. So this may confound the findings of RNS. These things we should keep in mind. However, in the setting of a definite myasthenic disorder, the pattern of decrement in infants is same as that found in older children and adults. So the same principles apply. Now, before showing the videos, I'll just go over the protocol briefly. So temperature, immobilization, then we have to perform a routine nerve conduction study to ensure the nerve is intact, to get a baseline CMAP, and also determine the supramaximal stimulus intensity. Then we perform the slow RNS at rest. Is a train of five to 10 impulses at three hertz, repeated usually three times, one, uh, one minute apart. We choose one distal, one proxima, as I already said. If there is decrement more than 10%, we go for post-exercise facilitation. That is a brief 10-second exercise. And we demonstrate the repair. However, if there is no significant decrement, but we still suspect the patient may have a neuromuscular junction disorder, we go for the prolonged exercise and look for post-exercise exhaustion, which multiplies the decremental response. Of course, it, it has to be remembered if the CMAP amplitude is low at baseline, this may suggest that the patient is having a presynaptic neuromuscular junction disorder. In that case, we can, of course, perform the rapid RNS. But there is another method which we will show where we do a CMAP, then do a brief 10 second exercise, 
and then do another CMAP and compare for any increment. Last but not the least, the findings of RNA should be correlated with NCV and EMG findings. So the videos, I'll just quickly go through the videos. Last video which I'll show because I have to cut short now. The last video which I'll show. is the substitution for rapid RNS. So first we get a, this is for Alnar, first we get a CMAP, baseline CMAP. This is the baseline CMAP. Then at 10 seconds, we get another CMAP and we compare the two. This maximal voluntary exercise at 10 seconds can substitute, can be done in place of a rapid RNS. So if we see there is an increment, but the increment is of course not significant. So this is how we substitute rapid RNS with a 10 seconds exercise. Okay. So uh, I think uh, we have covered the important aspects of the talk and I'll just wrap it up within a few, uh, within a couple of minutes. Okay. So, the other things which we, I'll just introduce two things. One is single fiber EMG, which is beyond the scope of today's talk. But this is very useful for neuromuscular junction disorder. And a normal SF EMG in a clinically weak muscle virtually excludes the neuromuscular junction disorder. What we look for is something called jitter and blocking. I just give a visual impression of it. We cannot go into the details for the lack of time. But the left one is normal. And the second one, we find that the, it is scattered. So this is increased jitter. And the, the right hand side, sometimes the C maps get dropped. The second and fourth are dropped. This is called blocking. So these are characteristic of an NMJ disorder. The pediatric myasthenia, uh, I think uh, it is rare, but we do find, see it. There's something called transient neonatal myasthenia, which usually resolve uh, by about one month. But for today's talk, electrophysiologically, the last thing I'll introduce is a congenital myasthenic syndrome. There is something called a repetitive CMAP after single stimulus. This is found in a slow channel CMS or end plate acetylcholinesterase de deficiency. In this case, we, stim we give the stimulus once and we find two CMAPs. Characteristically seen in these two disorders. So uh, just keep in mind that some other conditions can give rise to a decremental response, like a severe denervated disorder, like motor neuron disease, myotonic dystrophy, metabolic myopathies, et cetera. So the approach, uh, if we go for the overall approach, we do a routine motor NCS. If we get low CMAP, we can consider a rapid RNS or a post-exercise CMAP. If there is significant in increment, then it, it may be suggestive of a presynaptic disorder like CMAP increment in limbs. In normal CMAPs, we do a slow RNS. If there is significant decrement, it's postsynaptic disorder maybe there. In case there is no significant decrement, we can go for the exercise testing or single fiber EMG. Now the take home message will be to understand the basic physiology for RNS, the concept of safety factor, the main target of RNS, presynaptic versus postsynaptic, how we differentiate and rapid RNS, then the concept of exercise testing, facilitation and exhaustion, then the technical factors, especially in infants and young children, the false positives and the role of an overall NCS, EMG, RNS should be taken together. Uh, a single test is usually not sufficient. So thank you so much for your patience. So thank you, Dr. Audrish. If uh, there are any questions, we will take them. Any questions from the audience? So if, if the limb gets cold, then it can give a false negative result. That means it negates the decremental response. So because there are some, it's effect on the dynamics of acetylcholine. So, we should avoid a cold temperature of the limbs. Thank you. 